So imagine you lived in a world where languages could only be written with four-letter alphabets, where every keyboard for every computer had four keys for letters and only four keys for letters in a space bar. In this imaginary world, you can also only write words that are three letters long. So those four letters can only be used to write 64 different words. And like in English, there are a lot of synonyms, so those 64 different words only have 20 different meanings. What could you tell with such a, such a limited vocabulary? What sort of stories could you tell with such a limited language? Well, that limited language, that, that imaginary world, is our real genetic world, and it has been since the last common ancestor of all life on Earth. The four letters are the four letters of the genetic alphabet, G, C, A, and T, shown here in this image from part of the genome, part of the DNA of the bacterium E. coli. Those four letters can be, com can be put into three group combinations, three letter combinations that scientists call codons. And those codons can have 20 different meanings. Those are the 20 natural amino acids that get incorporated into proteins. So about 15 years ago, when I started my own research group at the, at the, uh, at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California, I became sort of obsessed with the question of what life would be like if you had more letters in the genetic alphabet. If you had a fifth and a sixth letter, you'd have 216 codons, or more than three times the words. So what would life be like? At the time, scientists were trying to find ways to trick cells into using their natural genetic alphabet, the four letters, to encode proteins with unnatural amino acids, amino acids in addition to those 20 that normally get incorporated into proteins. And it seemed to me, it occurred to me that really the best way to do this was to just give, to expand the genetic alphabet, to give the cells a, 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 a more, more, more letters, more ability to store that and retrieve that information. So before I tell you why we wanted to make proteins with unnatural amino acids and what we were up against, I need to give you a little more background information, a little more detail about DNA, a little refresher. So upon first glance, DNA is, a, is remarkable in how unremarkable it is. It's just a, a long string of these letters that I mentioned, G, C, A, and T. What makes DNA unique and remarkable and able to underlie the information storage of all biological information and the retrieval in the cell of that information is the selective pairing of those letters. G always pairs with C, A always pairs with T. And the way this works is that G holds, has a certain arrangement of hydrogen atoms on its edge and those, that arrangement of hydrogen atoms is also recognized by C. So G and C come together and they literally bind to the same hydrogen atoms, which causes them to stick together. Hydro uh, scientists call those, those interactions hydrogen bonds, and likewise A has a, a disposition of hydrogen atoms that's recognized by T, and so A and T hydrogen bond to form a pair. And so G pairs with C, A pairs with T, those hydrogen bonds are the same interactions that underlie the unique properties of water. So the individual molecules of water hydrogen bond to each other, they share hydrogen atoms, and that gives water some of its unique properties, and it's also what makes DNA able to be replicable and store information in a cell. So the way this works is that in a cell, DNA is double-stranded. There are those two strands that are stuck together by those letters hydrogen bonding to each other. And when a cell goes to divide, the first thing it does is it separates those into two individual single strands. And since the information needed for the double-stranded DNA is already present, because every time you have a G, the other strand has a C, the cell can immediately copy that into two new double-stranded pieces of DNA. And those pieces of DNA are what get passed on to the daughter cells. That's inheritance. That's genetic inheritance. Now, the way information is retrieved is similar. You have short stretches of DNA called genes. And those genes are copied into RNA. Now, RNA is a similar molecule, just subtly different from DNA. And that process of copying DNA into RNA is called transcription. So you, when you transcribe into RNA a stretch of a gene, that's called a message RNA or an mRNA, because it contains the message for the information that's in that gene. And it goes out into the cell, and it goes out to ribosomes, little protein synthesis factories. And there, it binds another molecule of RNA called a transfer RNA, or a tRNA. And what the tRNA does is it recognizes by those same hydrogen bonding patterns, those three-letter codons in the RNA, and that causes the tRNAs to line up along the mRNA one at a time. And those tRNAs also are bringing in one of the 20 natural amino acids. And so that causes the amino acids to line up in, in the right sequence to synthesize a protein. So in that way, the four letters of the genetic alphabet encode 
the 20 natural amino acids that are possible to build proteins with. So why were we interested in expanding the genetic alpha? We had a couple of motivations, and, and one was, like I said, we wanted to make proteins with unnatural amino acids. And why would we do that? Well, it turns out that protein therapeutics have absolutely revolutionized medicine. People are now curing diseases with proteins that were untreatable before with traditional small molecule drugs. And that's because with proteins, you can do things. You can have specificities and activities that are just outside of the scope of what's possible with small molecules. That in itself is remarkable because proteins, like I just said, they're actually pretty simple molecules. They're only made up of those 20 different building blocks. And within those 20 different building blocks, those properties must somehow determine the properties that a protein can have. And those 20 amino acids just don't have that many different properties. So if you could choose different unnatural amino acids, maybe with properties specific for doing some task that you're interested in, binding a specific target, curing a specific disease. Presumably, you could revolutionize protein therapeutics, which are already revolutionizing medicine. So that was one motivation. Now, a second motivation for expanding the genetic alphabet was basically that people said it was impossible. All through history, back to the Greeks, uh, people have thought that biological molecules were fundamentally different from non-biological molecules. And, you know, today people still believe this. So about half the country, it turns out, believes that biological molecules benefited from about four billion years of evolution. And the other half believes that they were specifically designed to do precisely what they're supposed to do by some sort of an intelligent designer. Either way, the prospects for a chemist coming in and making additional parts that work in these already perfectly optimized system would seem impossible. I'm a chemist, and I was intrigued by that idea, and I wanted to show that chemists and scientists could break through that impossible barrier. So before I tell you how my team ultimately succeeded in this, I have to give you a little bit more information uh, about DNA and a little more technical information now. So those letters that I referred to, scientists called them nucleotides. Nucleotides are actually complex little molecules, but the only part that's relevant, that's important for what I'm about to describe, are what scientists call the nucleobases. They're just one part of the nucleotide. In fact, they're the only part that differentiates the different nucleotides. So G, C, A, and T are only differentiated by their nucleobase. Now, the nucleobase is the part that reaches across between the two strands and forms those hydrogen bonds that I just mentioned, and you can see that here. So they form the rungs of the ladder. So when we thought about how to make a fifth and a sixth nucleotide, unnatural nucleotides, they would have to pair in DNA and during transcription just like the natural pairs do. And so when we were considering what forces we might draw on to do that, we wanted to try to draw on a force that was unlike what nature used. So instead of using hydrogen bonding complementarity, we thought we'd use something called the hydrophobic force, or the hydrophobic effect. And that's actually a pretty simple force. You're all familiar with it. Anyone who's tried to mix oil and water are familiar with this because they, they don't mix, they form two phases. That's because oil is hydrophobic. The word means literally water-hating. It wants to get out of water. An individual molecule of, an, of oil doesn't want to interact with wa molecules of, of water. It wants to interact with molecules of other molecules of oil. So that's why you get two phases. So oil likes to interact with oil and not water. So we envisioned, we imagined that if we made nu nucleotide analogs with hydrophobic nucleobases, that they might pair with each other well and not pair with the more water-like nucleobases of the natural nucleotides. So my lab went about, about uh, starting to make uh, synthesize unnatural nucleotides. Uh, we synthesized hundreds of them. We would evaluate them by putting them in the test tube and adding the proteins required for DNA replication or transcription into RNA, and we would examine how well our different nucleotides did. So we made lots of them, we made and we found out which ones were slightly better than the others, and we would take those ones that were slightly better, and we would make modifications to them and find out which modifications continued to make them a little bit better. And in that way, we optimized them, and over about 12 years, we finally found a small family of related analogs, related unnatural nucleotides that, were actually, that actually performed really well in the test tube. They were replicated in DNA and they were transcribed well into RNA. So with that, we were encouraged to try to go into a cell and try to deploy this system in a living organism, to try to expand the genetic alphabet of a living organism. And upon doing that, we came across another uh, a problem immediately, and that was how do you get these nucleotides into cells? So about this time, the media got involved, and these nucleotides had fancy names, scientific names, 
but the media didn't want to use those, so the media decided to call them X and Y. So my lab, uh, I guess, followed suit after a little while and just started referring to them X and Y as well. So the problem was, how do you get X and Y into a cell? And so we tried all sorts of things. We tried novel ways to maybe try to get the cells to make X and Y, and none of it worked. So the end, we cheated. So it turns out that a lot of cells from higher organisms, like plants and humans, have little compartments in them. Compartments, they're mitochondria, chloroplasts that you've probably heard of. And what's interesting is these chloroplasts have their own DNA. And some of them don't actually make the nucleotides to synthesize that DNA. Instead, what they do is they make a protein that assembles in the outer edge the membrane of the compartment that separates the inside of the compartment from the cell. And these proteins act to take nucleotides from the cell and transport them into the compartment. So they're called transporters. And so we imagined that maybe some of those transporters we could express in our bacteria, and maybe we could then simply add X and Y to the growing solution, the media in which the, the bacteria were growing, and maybe those transporters would take up our X and Y into the cell. So here was the experiment. I remember the day when my graduate student, uh, Dennis Malashev, actually performed these experiments. I remember it very well. Dennis took cells, and the first thing he did was he gave those cells DNA that had X and Y in it. Now, if he didn't do anything else, the cells just all died because they couldn't replicate the DNA. Instead, if he allowed the bacteria to express those transporters, shown here in green, and he added X and Y to the media, like I said, they grew. It was like one of those it's alive moments. I remember when Dennis came into my office, he was really excited. And in fact, sure enough, when Dennis then went and isolated that DNA after many divisions of the bacteria, he recovered the plasmid after many, many generations. And sure enough, X and Y was faithfully replicated and passed on to the daughter cells. Since the last common ancestor of all life on Earth all biological information has been stored in a four-letter alphabet. What you see here is an actual picture of semi-synthetic organisms happily growing and storing information with a six-letter alphabet. Now, if you're worried that some alien life form might escape from our lab, don't, don't worry. As I, already, as I already tried to emphasize, we have to add X and Y. And if we don't add X and Y, then our lab experiments have shown that the bacteria don't grow, that they lose the, the synthetic DNA because they can't, they can't replicate it, so they can't maintain it. Now, in addition to putting us at the doorstep of being able to produce, to encode proteins with unnatural amino acids, with possibly therapeutic properties that are far past what's, uh, what's possible now and possibly might enable treating diseases that have been uh, untreatable before, uh, over the last 15 years, we've learned a couple other lessons perhaps most important conceptually, is there's nothing special about the natural system that nature uses to encode information. And if that system, the most intimate of all systems in life, in fact, the system that defines life itself, if it can be engineered, manipulated, or, or, or changed, then maybe other processes in a cell, and in fact, maybe life itself can be similarly engineered or modified, and maybe new life forms created. Now, We've learned other things, and this is more personal. This is uh, for a young scientists out there maybe just starting their own careers. Combining different approaches from traditionally disparate fields, in my case, chemistry and biology, to focus on a problem can make uh, uh, tasks that seem impossible suddenly seem possible. Of course, you have to be passionate about the science that you're working on, because science is really hard. And you have to be passionate to persevere and to overcome all the challenges. But sometimes the greatest motivation is being, able, being told that what you're trying to do is impossible. In my case, the trick is to combine intellectual humility with limitless ambition, the sort of ambition that's famously tongue-in-cheek expressed in the famous engineering boast, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. Thank you.